Okay, let's continue. Um, so the large sample theory, uh, it was already the kind of the justification for that the posterior converges to normal distribution was part of that. Uh, the, there's a bit more of the kind of the brief outline of the um, justification for this in the appendix, but otherwise in this course we don't go, go to the, the details of how to prove this. Um, but this is, so in addition of kind of the uh, justifying the normal approximation at the mode, this large sample theory also uh, shows some connections then to uh, maximum likelihood inference and frequentist inference and kind of the, these are common terms, some of these asymptotic property terms that come up that it's useful, useful to um, recognize, recognize those. Um, one of the things is the now for the asymptotic normality, already mentioned that the high order terms in Taylor series increase slower than the second order term and then uh, those terms are smaller. But there was also the point that eventually likelihood dominates the prior. Um, from the prior we get just one term and it's not updating. You can also remember from this examples where we had conjugate priors, that conjugate priors could be imagined as uh, some number of prior observations. And then, of course, for the likelihood term, if you get more and more terms, that will start to dominate, and then you need to just look at this likelihood term, and then for the likelihood term, you can then solve these Taylor series expansion things. Uh, now there are the counter examples coming that show then that it's not always this asymptotic normality. Um, so in addition then, the, what is the, the large sample theory is often is this that can we somehow kind of discover truths? We know that given finite sample noisy finite sample, there's always uncertainty, but in a way that uh, we might be interested in what if we get more and more observations, do we all the time um, get closer to some truth? Now there's the challenge of then, what does it mean, this true underlying data distribution? We can have this true distribution in toy examples, if we simulate data ourselves, if we think about uh, games of chances, so uh, card games, um, in those we can have also this true distribution, but if we think about uh, nature, natural phenomena, humans, medical applications, it's more difficult that what would be that um, true underlying data distribution and also do they change, uh, stay the same uh, at the next moment. But then, so, so this, this true data distribution is not always well defined and even, but still we can use statistical inference and statistical models to do something useful even if we don't um, know the truth. Uh, however, and then this large sample theory, it, it thinks that it kind of the, assumes that there would be this true and then uh, what happens when we get more and more observations? Can we then uh, get closer and closer to this truth. Uh, and then it's interesting then that also that 
for this theory, we don't need exact form of the true distribution uh, as long as it has certain regularity conditions. This also shows that kind of the uh, somehow many of these asymptotic results are quite constrained. Um, consistency is this the the one that um, if true distribution is included in the parametric family we are using, parametric family referring to that we have finite number of parameters and the number of parameters is not increasing as the number of observations increase. So if we have a parametric family of distributions and the true distribution is included in that family and the true distribution is then so that the there is this theta zero, and with that theta zero, that's the true distribution. Then the posture converges to a point theta zero when n goes to infinity. So this is, of course, nice feature that it's consistent, that it's not uh, with infinite amount of information going to some other value, but it's also uh, kind of rare in these complex natural phenomena involving human society, uh, uh, health, and so on, it's unlikely that we would come up with some uh, parametric family which would be that rich that it would really uh, describe the true uh, data generating mechanism uh, and so on. But, I but if that would be the case, then we would know that um, we have consistency. And then when we say that that posture converges to a point, it really is that then we don't have any more any uncertainty that it's, it's just at one point. And this is the same result as for maximum likelihood estimate. Uh, so in those cases where the distribution, where the posture distribution converges to normal and then eventually converges to a point, when we have infinite amount of the data, prior doesn't matter anymore. Uh, and the maximum likelihood and maximum a posterior are at the same point. So we we get the same result with the infinite amount. And of course, now we need to remember that usually we have only finite amount of data and then um, the finite case performance is also important. <coughs> well, since, since I say that, okay, we don't usually have that complex parametric family that it could really describe humans and society, if true distribution is not included in the parametric family, there's no true theta zero, but then true theta zero is replaced with theta zero, which minimizes the kullback leibler divergence from the true distribution. So that's also then a uh, nice thing. And now the kullback leibler divergence, it's specifically, so what is the, the true distribution? and what is our model for the observ observations. And so, uh, and if we think about that, uh, do you know what is the, the posture predictive distribution? When we have infinite amount of the data, the posterior is, uh, point, and then we can talk about just that we have the predictive distribution PYI, and then that predictive distribution is anyway the closest possible to true distribution. So that's also a nice feature, and of course then it's much about how well we can choose the parametric family that uh, 
this would be still somehow useful distribution. Um, it's. I think that it, so in a way that this, this this is nice feature, but it's still sometimes a bit misleading that there are sometimes a bit surprises that if we have bad parametric family in a way model misspecification, bad model misspecification, then actually these theta zeros can be also kind of meaningless and our predictive distribution can be meaningless. And it doesn't help that it, it happened to be the closest given that parametric family. So that's why we have also like these posture predictive checking uh, approaches that help to also see whether our parametric family is anywhere near useful. And then we, then we could uh, uh, extend our parametric family. Uh, and it's, it's also that in a way that there's not necessarily a way to just this one, this KL thing. It, it's, since we don't know the true distribution, we are not able to know how far away how big this scale is, even if we know that it, we are choosing the theta zero, which minimizes this, we don't know how far we are, and then we don't know how wrong we are without additional checks. Um, Posture predictive checking is, of course, easy if we have infinite amount of data. And max, again, same as for maximum likelihood. Um, then we, it is also possible that we have models where the model is under identifiable so that there's a parameters or parameter combinations for which there is no information in the data and there's no single point where posture would converge. For example, this kind of model uh, linear model, now we have, it is kind of the simplest, one of the simplest possible that there would for some reason be two intercept terms. Um, if you think about more carefully, this could happen in a way, what if we would have actually, we think that we would have a model A plus B x1 plus c x2, but what if x1 happens to be constant and we didn't check that? If this is constant, then we practically have the same as a plus b plus and c times x2. In that case, we are not able to identify these separately. We are able to identify that the intercept, and so if the true model would be then um, alpha plus gamma x, we are able to identify that yes, that a, this a plus b would go towards alpha when we get infinite amount of data, but we are not able to separately identify alpha, uh, the a and b. And then it means that uh, with infinite amount of data, we still have uh, this kind of the line of points as long where some of these is this, and they all have um, like the uh, maximum likelihood and the maximum posterior there. So posture would converge to a line, and then the prior would determine the density along the line, uh, but not getting enough information would not help that we are on that line, and then it is possible that on that line, the prior will determine where the mode is, but we are not converging to a point. Um, We might have this kind of example that uh, 
we want to find out correlation between U and V. So uh, the example could be that we measure uh, height of the half of the students and weight of the half of the students, but we are not then able to learn how the height and weights correlate if there's no single student which would have observation both height and weight. And so the correlation would be non-identifiable. Um, and it's these kind of examples where we have non-identifiability happens surprisingly easily. Um, and then it is with the uh, kind of, it's not always easy to find it because sometimes, for example here, if it really was that, we thought that this might be identifiable, but we just didn't recognize that actually some of our data we put in is actually also something that's uh, not helping to identify. So it is often, even sensible models can be non-identifiable if we are not careful what we did observe or what data we need to collect to make different parameters identifiable. In hierarchical models, it's common that we have weak identifiabilities, like what is the population effect and group effects. Um, if population effect is bigger, we can make group effect smaller, so there can be kind of problems where where the information is. And this is of course problem also for other inference methods, including MCMC. So this is not just if we would be thinking about the uh, the large sample theory going to point or going towards uh, normal distribution. Uh, so in, in, in STAN, if we have a model which is not identifiable, uh, one possibility is that we see, for example, these tree depth exceedances. So if it's something like this where, uh, in a way, especially if we don't have a prior which would be then constraining, uh, we could have this identity uh, so that A can be get really, really big as long as B is then really, really big negative side. Um, of course, the prior usually makes this behave better, but we usually also see in these identifiable problems convergence issues. Um, I already mentioned, because in, in the beginning there was the mentioning that we, the posterior converges toward Gaussian often. I already mentioned this, that that often requires, that we have a parametric model where the number of uh, observations don't increase, uh, and the number of parameters don't increase with the number of observations. Um, example would be time series where we have points in time and we, when we get more and more observations, it's likely that we are, for example, learning some features of this process and those parameters might actually get also that the posture gets narrower and narrower but getting more and more data here doesn't help us to learn what's going on here. For we might have some um, indirect measurements, for example, for global temperature, and getting more global temperature measurements here doesn't Im increase. Uh, or doesn't decrease the uncertainty here. So 
But in this case, it is also that in a way that we have unknown latent value in each time point, and the number of unknowns is also increasing all the time. Um, and so in that case, then the posterior of each, at each time point does not convert to a point. Again, it of course depends on the model. It might be there, there could be strong dependency in like the prior for the latent values which could make it converge to a point. But then that that's, um, needs kind of additional um, constraints to be checked. Um, Special case of under-identifiability is aliasing. And there's also the Finnish uh, name for that mentioned. Uh, likelihood repeats in separate points. Here in this example, we had that likelihood repeated in points where A plus B uh, stayed the same. Um, example is mixture of normals. We could have mixture of normals so that we have one wide Gaussian and one narrow Gaussian. And we could name this that this is Gaussian 1, and it has parameters mu 1 and sigma 1. And this is then Gaussian 2 with mu 2 and sigma 2. And then we have the uh, mixing parameter alpha, uh, the lambda, mixing parameter lambda, and then there's weight lambda for the first Gaussian and minus uh, one minus lambda for the second. Uh, if you think about now the posterior for just mu, mu1, mu2. Here mu1 is smaller than mu2, so it would be like diagonal. So we could have a posterior somewhere here. But now there's uh, another mode such that we could actually just switch labels. So this is actually called 2 and this is called 1. 2, 2, 1, 1, and we replace lambda with minus 1 minus lambda, and we have actually another mode over there. So <clears throat> in this case, we would have two modes which are mirror images of each other, and with small amount of data, it's also possible that these can be actually connected. They can be kind of bow tie. But when we get more and more data, this will get more and more concentrated. And this can converge then to two points. And then, of course, again, the, uh, what we said about converging to one point or converging to normal distribution doesn't hold. Um, It's not always that harmful in a way that it necessarily doesn't matter that if we find only one of these cases, because since they are mirror images, our predictions would be also the same no matter which one we choose. But it makes the um, inference more difficult especially when we get more and more of these mirror images, and sometimes it can be also that we had a case that there's both mirror image modes, but also otherwise modes which are actually having a different uh, behavior and different predictive distribution. Uh, it makes also it more difficult to, like, 
uh, estimate in some cases where we might want to know uh, the marginalizing terms uh, it's in a way that if we find just the one mode we underestimate the amount of posterior mass also. Um, of course these kind of key examples where we observe aliasing it's also challenging for MCMC as any multimodal case where the modes are clearly separated is challenging. It makes also the convergence diagnostics more difficult because if we start from random points, we might that get that some of the chains get here and stay here, some of the chains get st uh, stay there. And then like R hat diagnostic would say that no, these chains are not mixing and we don't know is this okay. And so it is difficult even if the kind of the uh, they are just mirror images and our conclusions predictive uh, predictions would be same we just don't know what to do. Sometimes it's so that the change might switch from mode to another but it's just that it's still the switching between modes is so slow that it's again difficult to make this convergence diagnostic. Um, likelihood can be unbounded and then it's possible that there's no mode in the posterior. If you think about this mixed model case uh, and just the likelihood part, if there's one observation here, we could make this Gaussian component narrower and narrower, likelihood would increase. And eventually, if we make the bit of this Gaussian to go to zero, then the likelihood goes to infinity. We can solve this problem by having a prior saying that, okay, none of these Gaussian components can have a scale of zero. Um, and so, if the prior doesn't go to zero when scale of one Gaussian component goes to zero, we have unbounded posterior. And then it is also that if this would have this zero width, then at each of the data observation location, we would have infinite spike. So here, if, if we would have the, one of these uh, at the place, and then we would have infinite spikes at the, each location of the data observation. And then this would be, of, of course, problem for any inference method, including MCMC. Uh, can be avoided by priors, which avoid this kind of the uh, infinite likelihood cases. For the mixture models, they are also uh, for removing the aliasing. People have proposed and used approaches that let's have, for example, ordering that uh, mu1 has to be smaller than mu2 so that we would just remove uh, this part. We don't have aliasing with the ordering, but it happens that when we get more and more mixture components, components these orderings are not necessarily sufficient and they're still possible of these bow tie, half bow tie distributions, nasty. Mixture models are difficult to make exact Bayesian inference. Um, Mixture models actually have also identifiability, identifiability problem. It's not possible at the same time identify number of mixture components and shape of the mixture components. You can think of it as that 
if the true distribution is student D distribution, and you would make a mixture of normals, when the amount of data goes to infinity, you need actually infinite number of normals to model that student D. So there's no true number of normals you could use for the student T at the same same way. If uh, you know, that your uh, mixture components doesn't match the true mixture components, when you get more and more data, only thing what can happen is that you need more and more of those components. So it's not possible to identify the number of components if you don't know the shapes. If you would know the shapes, then it might be possible to find out the number of components, but it's quite unlikely that you would know, know the shapes. So the mixture models, in mixture modeling literature, there's too much of discussion that trying to identify the number of components and then trying to make some uh, conclusions based on that. It, it's complicated. Um, back to the, the unbounded case, so it's also that uh, if we have a prior which is close to a prior allowing unbounded posterior, we may get almost unbounded posterior, which can be computationally very difficult also. We might have improper posterior, um, and so that uh, these asymptotic results assume that the probability sums to one. Um, this is very simple example, this binomial model with beta zero zero prior and extreme observation that um, all the observations belong to the same category and uh, we get uh, this improper posterior. It's more likely that this happens, these improper postures happen, for example, in Stan by uh, having unidentifiable parameter without prior. Um, Stan can sometimes kind of to give a warning that it looks like that you have uh, improper posterior the sometimes in Stan typical is, is that you declare parameter but don't actually use it anywhere in the model. And then you have just a uniform distribution for that and then sampling pairs. And then you should use proper priors. Of, um, Helps there. And again, prior close to an improper prior may produce almost improper posterior, so you may again have a computational problems. Uh, prior distribution does not include the convergence point. Um, and then if our parameter is discrete, then uh, this, the, the prior probability for the theta zero is zero. Or in a continuous case, then we would have a prior probability in the neighborhood of theta zero, um, or the, uh, zero. And then the convergence result based on the dominance of the likelihood do not hold. So. Uh, no matter how much information you get from the data, you can't counteract zero prior probability, zero prior density. And this is something also that you should think about in, in that way that um, when fitting a linear model, it means that you are saying that prior probability for function to be nonlinear is zero. If the true data 
looks like this, it doesn't matter how much more observations you get. If you are fitting a linear model, it will get more and more accurate. The, the posture will get narrower and narrower. But since you assign that uh, non-zero probability only for the linear models, you are not able to learn with infinite amount of the data that it's actually not non-linear function which is needed. So we should have a positive prior probability density where needed. And then that's why also uh, non-parametric models are useful because they extend also that having some probability for nonlinear models and more kind of shapes you didn't think of. Um, convergence point can be at the edge of the parameter space. And then we can have kind of half normal, for example. So let's say that the uh, we have this normal distribution with theta, and we have a restriction that theta has to be zero, uh, so non-negative. And then assume that actually the true value is exactly zero. When we get more and more data, we get to the point, yes, but the Gaussian uh, is then truncated. So it's a half normal distribution. And of course, this, this can be also an easier difficult for MCMC, these kind of cases. Uh, Tails of the distribution, so in a way that the, we know that the posture converges towards Gaussian, and it's possible that we get already quite good mean and variance estimates at some point. But if we are interested in extreme tail quantiles, probabilities, it might be that actually then the normal distribution is not that good far in tails. Um, for example, for a parameter which is constrained to be positive, given finite n, normal approximation assumes non-zero probability for negative values and then depending on, of course, how close we are to zero, whether that's harmful or not, but how much probability there is for non-negative values. So those were the, the counter examples. Uh, the book chapter has a, a little bit about these frequency evaluations, and I still mention these. I have also additional slides, but then comparing frequency statistics and Bayesian statistics, but I will leave that for the next week, so I can call it uh, um, not hurrying too much, and then also next week you can uh, propose topics, I can talk more. Um, so, Bayesian theory has epistemic and aleatory probabilities. And then these frequency evaluations focus on frequency properties given aleatoric repetition of observation and modeling. So what if uh, same data generating mechanism would generate some data kind of the, uh, again and again? And um, Then consistency is also one of these, but it, it's also, it's only asymptotically. Um, there's asymptotic unbiasedness. There's also finite case unbiasedness. Um, but this unbiasedness that on average we are correct is not that important in Bayesian inference. Small and decreasing error is more important. Um, we might sometimes look at the kind of that 
it's ac at least approximately unbiased, but we, it's not where we start from. We don't constrain that our estimate has to be unbiased. Asymptotic efficiency, no other point estimate with smaller squared error. It's again something that Bayesians are not uh, usually looking. So specifically, the Bayesian estimate la always starts from using just the Bayesian theory. So it's only uh, kind of the side product that sometimes these estimates might be asymptotically efficient. Um, calibration, I will talk then next week a little bit more about these different intervals, calibration and the collective frequentist confidence intervals versus Bayesian posterior intervals. Um, calibration is again so that in the frequentist statistics can al al also start from requiring that we want to have intervals which are calibrated but then don't necessarily care whether that interval is short or would likely to have the true value there. Um, but this is also something that Bayesians tend to look at. Uh, the posture interval would have the, in simulations the true value approximately as many times as the nominal uh, probability for that interval. Uh, I, and then for the predictive interval, it's easier because we can also then actually uh, compare to true future values or um, sometimes use a bit of cross-validation things. But anyway, for the Bayesians, it's more, the, the again, the deriving also these intervals starts from Bayesian theory and decision theory and then it can be useful in a way to look at, for example, how much pri adding prior information, how much changing the model, how these will affect these um, unbiased, the amount of bias or calibration. Uh, and that way that the patients often evaluate these things, but they don't start constraining that they, they have to be exactly these. Okay, but then since it's already past four, I will continue next week more about then the um, connections and differences between frequentist and Bayesian statistics, machine learning. Questions?